Right, let's move on. Hurling, uh, what a weekend it was. Joe Canning, very angry in the aftermath. Well, not very angry, but a little bit pissed off about the fact that uh, his team's character had been questioned in the build-up to the replay. Have a look. Um, you know, we show great character. We were only behind overall in, in both matches once, I think. Um, and we didn't get a lot of respect, I think, during the week from, from media and, and such. We didn't, our character was questioned, I thought. Um, people were saying that you know we didn't perform and stuff like that, but only being behind in a, in an All Ireland semi final over over two games in one one instance um, just shows uh, the character we have. Matthew Hanlon is with us this morning. Matthew, good morning to you. How you doing? Morning, lads. How's it going? Is it possible that Joe Canning isn't actually talking about people outside the camp? That inside the camp, somebody's job this week was to question the team's character, and that actually that's just how the dynamic works, that somebody in the management team is detailed during the week to go, listen, you get into them there, and you just make sure that they have a, an axe to grind, and that that's the dynamic he's talking about, because it didn't seem like anybody else outside of the, the camp, certainly in the media, was saying that uh, this Galway team lacked character. Yeah, it, it, it may have been a motivational tactic from the Galway management. You don't really know. Um, you can only go on what Joe has said there. But I suppose from a media and journalistic standpoint, like not many people had written them off. Most of them had them as hot favourites going into the game. And even after, the narrative was more Galway's missed chances and Clare coming back into it. And that Galway probably should have won the match. Um, so I don't know if it's probably something that the management probably used to get another extra few percent out of the Galway team to go look. We need to prove these wrong. Go out there and show them what character you have. And in fairness, they, they showed up the second day and got the job done. We were chatting about this a little bit earlier on, and I was kind of comparing them to um, a zombie, that they're never dead. And that actually the Great Kilkenny team had that same ability. And it was only at the end of the season you would di kind of diagnose, oh, that's the bit where they actually they won the All-Ireland. Owen isn't convinced, though. He just thinks that um, Clare kind of threw that one away more than it being Galway's zombie-like qualities that got them through. What's your take? Um, I think, I suppose, winning in All-Ireland gives you a real self-belief within the team and they are a confident bunch that they know that they don't panic when it gets into a scenario where their last five minutes of a game, one point or two points in it, they don't panic. And the same was evident yesterday when Clare had all the momentum, hit the post, had every chance going and they were clawing them back. They still managed to get the crucial scores at the very end and managed to stop uh, Clare getting, getting their attacks at the last two minutes. So I think it's more about game management and knowing how to win big games. And that's probably the, the confidence that comes with winning in All-Ireland. Yeah. Like ultimately, I don't think anybody's questioned Galway's character. It doesn't necessarily have to be a character thing that people point out that you've thrown away big leads in multiple games. And now this is the third time you've seen it this summer, Matthew, where Galway have done exactly that. Ultimately, though, it's a mark of their character that they've ended, ended up surviving yeah. on all three occasions. But there has to be something there. It might not be a, men a mentality thing. It might not be a, an element of character. I wonder, is it an element of the opposition manager figuring out Galway and then Galway being reactive on the second occasion? Are they able to do that? Is their plan B able to stand up to scrutiny? It could be. Um, I suppose if you look at, take the first game, for example, I think Clare sees the momentum of that game when they put Galvin back as sweeper and then Galway were probably guilty of playing too, mu too much ball directly on him and Galvin got on loads of breaks and set up Clare's attacks and that really dragged them back into the game. Whereas this, this in the replay, Clare, sta Clare started with Galvin as sweeper, but Galway played the ball excellently, diagonally into space, away from Galvin and he didn't get on near as many breaks. And even when he did, there was such pressure on him from Conor Whelan at centre forward that he could that all he could do was a long aimless ball into the football. Tournament. So that was uh that was how they attacked. That was something that, that um Air struggled with because the long long ball to John Condon wasn't working and Park Manning the sweeper was cleaning up a lot. And then you see when Clare took advantage of that, they played the ball through the middle third, used their wing backs, midfield and wing forwards before well, the Matthew, just a second Matthew, just having a bit of trouble with the uh, the line there. Yeah, it's uh like there does kind of need to be kind of a, a separation of these two things. This kind of uh, like we're, we're probably reading a lot into Joe Canning's comments, and maybe you're right. Maybe there was no, maybe it was just kind of like a, a technique within the camp to get them motivated for the second game. But there is a lot of there is there is like three occasions here, as we've said, where this has happened. Like it, it may not be a character thing, but maybe a flaw of a different kind. It, or the, these teams are all very evenly matched. 
Yeah, that's the other thing. That's the thing. Like the, it has been. And we talked about this last week after the two unbelievable games in Crow Park. That it, it just showed up this championship for what it is, an absolute barnstormer that anybody from the top seven or eight counties can actually have a chance of winning this thing. Does it need an outsider to win it for it to be the greatest championship of all time? <clears throat> Well, like if Galway win, it's the defending champions who are favourites beforehand coming through very difficult matches, but ultimately getting it done. Not quite as exciting in the history books as, ooh, Limerick, out of nowhere. I, I think when we look back in the history books, there was nothing dull about Cork and Kilkenny winning back-to-backs. I think uh, a great team doing back-to-back and solidifying their greatness is always great for, for a narrative. That being said, when it comes to narrative ahead of this year's All-Ireland Hurling Final, nothing beats the Limerick story. Uh, and then winning a first All-Ireland uh, Final in 45 years, um, like that, that would just be amazing. So certainly in terms of narrative, Galway winning would not be what we want from hashtag narrative. But it's still a good story. Back-to-back champions are always a good story. And actually, the story is less relevant than the quality of the games, ultimately. Ultimately. And the, the memories we take away from a summer like this, I, I can't believe I'm saying it, but I'll have hurling memories from the summer of 2018. Who'd have thought it? Well, you won't have any football ones, will you? Uh, you know, let, let's not go there for the time being. Let's, let's, let's not uh, touch that nerve. Uh, we will, we'll be touching that nerve a little bit later on. And McGinley and Pat McEnany are going to join us. We will talk football in a couple of minutes' time. We'll get back to Matthew Hanlon in just a moment, talking about um, the uh, weekend's hurling action. I, I think probably we do read too much into what players say in the aftermath of games like this. Yeah, like th- th- there might not have been much in it. Like he literally said, people who question their character this week. That's, uh, maybe that's us in the media being a little bit too self centered, saying he must be talking about us. People were saying, I think we're the only a, people that count. I think there's a Phil Thompson character in the Galway setup whose job it is to go out there and go, and in training, to go, what the hell happened to you? You were winning that match, do you know? Like, <laughs> they, they just go down to Tume and pull a random lunatic off the street and it's like, get in there and shout at the players. This was the assistant manager at Liverpool. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not making the comparison to Phil Thompson, but uh, somebody there to rile them up. And it's like, you, you look angry enough to question the character of my team. Get in there into the pitch and shout at my players, and maybe that's what happened. No, yeah, we'll, we'll give the uh, we'll give the line a go, and we'll go back to uh, Matthew Hallen. Um, talk to us a little bit then about the ebb and flow of this game, and, and why Galway have been allowing teams back into it. Um, I really think in the middle of a game, Galway were going well, right? They got they got up nine points again after twenty minutes. In those first twenty minutes, Clare set up with a, with a sweeper, got Colin Galvin back, but he didn't enjoy near as much space or wasn't afforded an easy breaking ball as he'd got in the first game. So that meant that Galway played long, deep ball into Johnny Glynn, which proved fruitful. I was either winning a clean, or Conor Cooney or Niall Burke were in around and winning breaks, or Galway managed to find a half forward who, who took the ball, carried the ball, engaged the sweeper, and then off, offload to a runner, uh, which that's ultimately what Galway, uh, how Galway got ahead. On Clare, on the other hand, they tried to play long, direct ball to John Conlon. Um, the, it was probably... Um, due to the pressure that Galway's forwards were putting on Colin Galvin, that he couldn't pick out any short passes to midfield or middle third or into space up front. Once they went long to Conlon, he didn't seem to be able to win any ball clean and Park, Park Mannion seemed to be able to pick up every single break. So, in effect, it nearly backfired on Clare starting that way because Mannion had more of an impact as a sweeper as Galvin did. Um, you can see, I suppose, from the 16, 17 minute on, um, Galvin tried to play it more positively. He, there's a couple of attacks where he actually engaged as an overlapping runner. And that he managed to get the ball inside the Galway 65 and then play a better diagonal ball into space to Conlon, which they were able to get um, a second-hand uh, break off him. So a ball back out to Shane O'Donnell or Podge Collins. Um, and then during that time, they dragged out their half-forward line. So both Reedy, Tony Kelly and Podge Collins, you'll see instances in the 10 minutes before halftime where they all won breaking ball inside their own half. So that left more space to hit in Galway's half. And they played better ball into diagonally into space and Shane O'Donnell uh, was winning more ball as well. And that's what really dragged them back into the game. And then when they came out after halftime, six points down in all Ireland semi-final, they, you know, they, they were going to throw the kitchen sink at it. So they pushed up 15 on 15. And then you can see two, he went w- way longer with puck outs. So in the first half, I think 75, 80, 80% of his puck outs went short. In the second half, it was 75, 80% of his puck outs went long because they really committed to getting on the breaks and targeted Peter Duggan. And they had men in around him to get those breaks. I think the first score after half time is really uh, an indication of that Ian Galvin's point where I think they had a string of maybe four to five, five 20, 15 yard passes in the middle third waiting for the opportunity to break through rather than pumping long direct ball into Conlon, which didn't work in the first half. And then Galvin managed to find a space to slot it over on his left. Okay, uh, that, yeah, that, that explains it. And, and so that means it's not just, um, 
you know, they get complacent in the middle of a game. It's like there are tactical changes, the opposition improves, the opposition plays well. We are talking about really good teams here. Yeah. Oh, in the middle of a game, it is very difficult to... to uh, in, when you're in a player, you're concentrating on... The, in a game, you're in, concentrating on the ball and the game. And it, it really takes a break in play to really figure out, OK, the other team has made a switch here. And it, maybe that's where Galway line need to be a small bit quicker to identify what Claire have done um, to, I suppose, counteract that. Whereas the first 20 minutes, Galway had it to a T. When Clare kind of slightly altered their tactics, it seemed Galway struggled a bit more. And then the second half... Um, they clear change tactics altogether and push straight up and was an orthodox 15 on 15 game so uh but when you're in the middle of a game it is really hard to read that i suppose that's where the messages come from the line we need to tweak things a little bit here um what worked first in the first half isn't quite working now can you see them building up a, a similar sort of lead against limerick if it's 15 on 15 um I can't. I think. I think the, the final is going to be a very different game because I can't see both teams. Um, I can't see they, they're not going to want to play a sweeper. They're going to want to take each other on uh, fifteen on fifteen. And what Limerick do is quite similar to what Clare did um, in the second half, in that they drag out their half half forward line. Their half forward line essentially plays midfield or even in their half back line. They drag to leave space for the likes of Galan inside, and I think that's what Galway are used to. So Galway would probably sit back and not allow them to be dragged out to cover that space off. But I think it's a, it's going to be a, cl- a close-fought game. Limerick proved their capabilities of fighting back against Cork with six points down 15 minutes to go. I think Galway would be acutely aware that if they build up a lead like they did in the game against Clare and, the, and, and in the replay, that they can't afford to let it slip because that's twice they're after getting away from being in winning positions to almost being clawed back and overturned. Um, two quick questions for you. The first one is, who's your hurler of the year up to this point? Uh, I think Park Mannion. Um, I think he's been one of Galway's best players throughout the championship. I think he, he's really a leader at the back. And it's more the composure on the ball when he comes out. You very rarely see him give away a ball. He carries it and either gets fouled or plays a short hand pass or plays a ball into space for his forward. And time and time and again in the first half and the second half yesterday, when a ball needed to be won at the back, he was the man that came out with it. And I think he's been a real leader for Galway th- this year. Um, for me, he's probably the front runner at the moment. And the other one is, who do you make like uh, uh, ignoring the way the odds are going to go for this? Who do you actually make favourites for the final? Uh, like I'm, I'm, try- I'm weighing this one up in my head. Um, two weeks versus three weeks uh, in terms of preparation is plays in favour of Limerick. Uh, Limerick showed the strength of their panel um, against uh, Cork in the semi final. And that Limerick team is now full of belief and full of confidence, and they've got three weeks to prepare for the biggest game of their lives. They're under-21 All-Ireland winners. They know this chance might not come around again. Then it comes to Galway. Is there motivation? Like The, the question is, yes, they're back in an All-Ireland final the second year in a row. They haven't done two in a row since the late 80s. Can they do it again? The big question is, if they can get Mac and Ernie back into the centre of the fence, that will make a big difference to them. But... Like I think it's it's fifty fifty in my eyes. Um, I, I'm probably going to go. I said Galway um, when I tipped earlier on in the year. I still think that they've got a panel um, and they're playing well enough to win it. But it's all about how Limerick start. If Limerick get up ahead of steam, they're going to be very difficult to stop, especially with the amount of support they have and belief they have behind them as well. It's going to be a classic, uh, Matthew. Typically brilliant analysis. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. No worries. Thanks, guys. Speak to you soon. That's.